coming up on Pet Heroes. A heroic police dog and his partner come face to face with an armed and dangerous suspect. Will their training and instincts be enough to save an unsuspecting family caught in harm's way? And what impact will their actions that fateful night have on future police service dogs? Hi, I'm Jason McCoy and welcome to Pet Heroes. Our pets often leave lasting impressions and their legacies can live on long after they're gone. Well, let's look at the extraordinary story of a police dog named Sear, whose life and legacy continues to impact future generations of service animals. Steve Kay is a sergeant with the Saskatoon Police Service, where he supervises the police canine unit. As far as he's concerned, there's no better place to live and no better job to have. Good boy, come on, bud. I've been doing this for 14 years. The animals are amazing, and I'm trying to think of the last time I went out with my dog and he didn't show me something new. Um, it's just, it's, I, I'm pretty privileged to have the job that I have. Police spend months training dogs before they are ready for active service. And these loyal animals bring special skills that make them an irreplaceable part of a frontline law enforcement team. There isn't an instrument out there we can buy that can help us track an offender from a crime scene to where he may be hiding. The number of officers, for instance, it would take to search a large warehouse for a perpetrator hiding inside that warehouse is, is massive. A dog will clear no time at all. Finding small articles, concealed articles, concealed narcotics, I think their importance is, is tremendous. Officer K is currently training his fifth dog since joining the canine unit, a German Shepherd named Bear. Each dog has its strengths, and each one captures a piece of his heart. But there's one dog whose star will always shine brighter than the rest, and his name is Seer. We almost didn't get Seer. The breeder we went to was just outside of Edmonton in Sherwood Park, and uh, I, I was very new to the team. Officer K and a more experienced trainer visit a dog breeder's kennels early one morning in the spring of 1998. Alone at the kennel, they spend some time with a group of young German shepherds who are happy to greet them. The senior trainer's eyes immediately land on Seer. The pair leave, but return when the breeder is available and ready to meet with them. You know, she brought dogs out that, that we could look at that were, were available for sale. I was just new dog handler. You're overwhelmed. Hey, they all have fur right on. I want one. But our trainer said, you know, there's one dog that you're not showing us. Our trainer saw something in him, whether it was his drive or how he presented himself, and the breeder said, oh, and he's not for sale. Seer, as it turns out, is the breeder's personal dog and her daughter Jacqueline's best friend. But even at the young age of five, Jacqueline knows her buddy was born to track down bad guys and protect the innocent. After Officer K promises to take good care of Seer, Jacqueline agrees to let him go. Officer K brings Seer home to meet with his own children, daughter Erin and son Taylor. Seer is dad's new work partner, but he quickly becomes a beloved member of the K family. A lot of people didn't think he was a police dog. He's a beautiful, beautiful German Shepherd, just an absolutely gorgeous animal. Very gentle, very quiet. He was more than content to hang out with the family. If you met him in the yard, you would think there wasn't an aggressive bone in his body. He was a fantastic dog. Seer was a great pet. He was just caring and nice and cuddly, and he'd come in the backyard with us, play around. Like, he would just go and go. He was just great. Officer K is eager to put his new partner to work, but first, he needs to see what Seer is made of. When we first started trying to do our, uh, our criminal apprehension training, I remember the same trainer that had spotted Seer uh, got one of our great big protective sleeves out. We were going to do one of our first agitation sessions with him. And Seer's response to it was to walk behind me and sit, and it's like, Oh, buddy, if you're going to protect me, you got to do a little better than that. 
Police service dog training is intensive. From running pursuits to physical takedowns, their natural instincts are honed to respond to dangerous and difficult situations. They all have their strengths, they all have their weaknesses. Um, we sort of try and assess a dog's personality to see what it's suited for and how it can best assist the service. As Sear grows into the job of police service dog, he becomes a trusted partner to Officer K. Calm and obedient, yet always ready for action when required. And then when it was go time for work, he was ready to go. It was the greatest game in the world. Officer K and Sear have worked together for nearly three years, with a number of arrests to their credit. But nothing can fully prepare them for the events on the night of May 20th, 2001. Sear and Officer K respond to a call about a domestic dispute in a quiet suburban neighborhood. There's a warning from dispatch. Proceed with extreme caution. Firearms may be involved. It's the kind of call that Officer K and his unit dread the most, because there's no telling how dangerous the situation may become. Coming up, can Sear put an end to a dangerous standoff between police and an armed man? Saskatoon police officer Steve Kay and his canine partner Sear respond to a domestic call involving a firearm. They arrive on the scene and quickly get to work. We were going to set up a containment around the residence just so that we could secure the neighborhood, ensure the safety of the neighbors, uh, and call the individual out of his residence to us uh, so he was on neutral ground. Just as police are getting into position, the suspect makes a surprise move. The garage door in the house opened, and the suspect's truck came out of the garage. So we were hightailing it back to the car because he was out of there. Time is critical as Officer K leads Sear back into his vehicle and gives chase. Sear and Officer K join two other squad cars in a dangerous high speed pursuit of the suspect that soon heads out of town onto country roads northeast of Saskatoon. Outside the city, RCMP units are called to join in the chase that sees the suspect flee at speeds of up to 160 kilometers per hour. The Mounties lay tire spikes across the road in an effort to cripple the suspect's speeding truck. They were successful in deflating the tires on the suspect vehicle. So the speeds dropped down as his tires started to deflate. The suspect's vehicle grinds to a halt in a field near a farmhouse with an innocent family inside, oblivious to the threat nearby. As soon as we stopped, you know, I wasn't sure if he was going to immediately flee on foot. It's a wild card. We, you, we have no idea what's going to happen at this point. The suspect is a recently bankrupted businessman who has been served an order barring contact with his wife. In other words, he's a man with nothing to lose. And it was at that point that he exited the vehicle and we all saw that he had a handgun in his hands. Officer K and his colleagues know they must not let this ticking time bomb get to the farmhouse. Sear is poised and ready for action. All his training and work with Officer K over the past three years is coming to bear in this one risky moment. Sear knows exactly what to do, but what he cannot know is that the silver object in the suspect's hand presents a lethal danger. Initially, we took a position to cover up. Once we saw that there was a firearm involved, I was holding Sear here, and he was kind of peeking around the front corner of the car. Uh, it was important that the dog, you know, have an idea, a visual observation of the suspect. Wendy McClellan is a doctor of veterinary medicine and shares her insights on German Shepherds. German Shepherds as a breed are very strong, versatile, very courageous, loyal, and they also have a very high prey drive. They get excited. Their work is fun for them. His only focus is, is getting that criminal down. That's what he's been trained for. That's what his handlers told him to do. He's waiting for the signals. He's gone through this a thousand times in training. He's prepared, and he knows that this is a real deal. The suspect says nothing and no one has a clue what he'll do next.
raised the pistol up above his hand and discharged two rounds in the air, uh, and then had his arm come down by his side. And just it, it was it was almost surreal. He, uh, he just sort of stood looking at the members that were behind him. Clearly, the suspect is unstable and unpredictable. Acting as if the police are powerless to stop him, the suspect turns away and heads toward the house, making a bad situation even worse. We can't have these people be put in jeopardy by allowing that individual to walk to their residence. As the suspect turns his back to the police, Officer K knows that it's now or never. There was a pretty small window of opportunity there where he wasn't facing us. I thought Sierra uh, might be able to help us. So I sent him. And he took off as, as fast as he could. Sear is only about 10 meters from his target when the suspect turns and fires. Sear doesn't even break stride. He'd hit him pretty hard, and he was gripping him, hanging on. But that's when this fella took his, uh, his pistol and held it right against the side of Sear. The police have no choice but to return fire. They converge on the man, desperate to disarm him before more damage is done. I remember handcuffing him and getting the gun away from him and turning and looking and seeing Sear laying at the feet of a female Mountie at the side of the highway. That wasn't good because he shouldn't have been laying down at that point. With the gunman disarmed and restrained, Officer K checks on his partner. Yeah, he was in bad shape. I learned after that, that first round. Oh. Oh, it went right through his heart. We're 90 miles from help, so... Just, oh, held him while he died. just trying to uh, comprehend everything that had gone on. This is a night that will haunt Steve K. Coming up, Sears' death in the line of duty becomes big news, while Steve K struggles to cope with the loss of his partner. Officer Steve K and his canine partner Sear are called to a situation involving an armed gunman. During an heroic takedown, Sear is shot and fatally wounded. News of the incident spreads like wildfire. Our top story, a high-speed chase involving the police. This has resulted in the death of a canine officer named Sear. Sear's heroic sacrifice has been met with great sadness in the Saskatoon area. Officer K recalls going home the next morning as one of the most difficult and lonely drives of his life. It seems to me Aaron might have come running out to the car to let him out of the car. <laughs> and uh, it's, you know, gee, Squidge, I don't know what to tell you. There's, I got to talk to you inside. And I knew from there, I was like, something isn't right. So went inside and he told us, yeah, what happened. It was hard. After three years as a dedicated and loyal partner to Officer K and a beloved pet, Sears' tragic death hits the entire family hard. I remember we had a big set of windows that overlooked our backyard, and you could see Sears' kennel from there. Oh, guys, he's not coming back. You know? It's tough. It made me feel very, very sad. Like, it wasn't even real. Like, did this really just happen? Like, he was just here. It was really hard to deal with the loss of him because he was like a family member. It affected my dad greatly, I think, because he worked with him every day. They were partners together. Yeah, I gave some hard, hard thought that day about pulling the pin, so just too much. Meanwhile, Sears' tragic death is met with an outpouring of support from the citizens of Saskatoon. 
Steve K may have been Sears' handler, but Sear was Saskatoon's dog. What begins as an outpouring of grief and condolences soon grows into a flood of community building. In the obit that was published in the paper, we asked if people would, you know, instead of sending uh, cards, flowers, or anything like that, just make a donation to the SPCA. The community is so touched by Sears' sacrifice that donations begin flooding in. They even build a park and dedicate it to Sears' memory. You know, if you look at the park they built out there in memory of Sear and the, and the run area where, you know, now people who are potentially going to adopt a dog can take it to this run area that our citizens donated money uh, in memory of Sear for to assess a dog, it's phenomenal. And the park is only the beginning. The inspiration keeps coming. David Dubay and Heather Ryan are Saskatoon entrepreneurs well known for giving back to their community. They're also big animal lovers who were especially troubled by Sears shooting. Well, I first heard about Sears' story. I was driving to the north end of town and it came over a radio broadcast. And I sat there and I thought, there are ways to make sure that this doesn't happen again or as sure as heck doesn't happen as often. How tragic, you know, to have a life lost in the line of duty like that. That night, the couple sits down and begin wrestling with the question of how to make things safer for Saskatoon's canine unit. What can they do to help avoid future tragedies involving weapons and dogs like Sear? After a lot of research and legwork, they approach the canine unit with an offer to fund, on an ongoing basis, bulletproof vests for each dog, but only if the unit wants them. Let's just see, you can try them out and if the officers don't like them or the dogs aren't comfortable in them, we understand, but it's a no risk opportunity to try to provide extra protection. The same protection that, you know, the, our officers have, it would be great to have our canine officers have. The vests David and Heather are willing to invest in are Canadian made and have been embraced by canine squads, search and rescue teams and military units worldwide. I think the more protection we give them, the more it puts in the minds of the criminals that they need to respect the system, they need to respect the officers and follow their instructions. Offering the same protection as vests worn by human SWAT team members, the canine vests have saved service dogs from all manner of attacks, from pitchforks to Molotov cocktails to close range gunfire. Once the Saskatoon handlers try the vests out, there's no going back. The canine unit gladly accepts David and Heather's offer to fund the vests for many years to come. You know, we send these dogs into places. I don't want our, our human officers going. I certainly don't want to go. And if we're going to do that, let's give them the best protection possible. And, you know, we're very grateful and fortunate that, that the canine unit agreed to do it. Despite Sears' growing legacy and the positive things coming from his devastating loss, Officer K is still unsure whether he wants to return to work with the canine unit. That bond is often so strong that police officers in this scenario where they lose their dog have a hard time moving forward. They often can't imagine replacing that animal because they become best friends. It's very traumatic for a handler to lose a dog. But a timely letter from one of Sears' oldest, dearest friends helps the healing process immensely. Dear Steve, I want to thank you for taking very good care of my puppy, Sear, for supporting him and loving him. He was born to track down bad guys and help save other people's lives. I love Sear very much, and I know that you and your family did too. Thank you again for all you have done. Jacqueline. Perhaps the most lasting legacy Sear left to Saskatchewan is new legislation that better protects service animals. The Honorable Don Morgan is the province's justice minister and says Sear's shooting was pivotal in instigating the changes. We've increased the penalties for interfering with a guide dog or a service animal to $25,000 and up to two years in jail. 
I think to the public, it's a recognition of something the public already feels that there's an importance to the animal. But to the police force, it's a recognition of the work that they do and the support that they need for the animals. That's a boy. The fact that Sears' death led to benefits for so many animals and animal lovers ultimately helped Steve Kay recover from the pain of losing his best buddy and workmate. Steve returned to the job he'd loved so much. I decided I was going to stay on the team. I was going to work another dog. And um, that's the best decision I think I could have ever made. I've been privileged to do this work. And that I stayed and stuck with it. It was, it was a tough call. But I couldn't be happier that I stuck with it. It doesn't even feel like a job. No, it's, it's good. And even though it's been more than 10 years since Sear lost his life in the line of duty, there's no chance he'll be forgotten. He gave his life in the line of duty to protect our officers and to protect the citizens. If that isn't a hero, I don't know what one is. Sear was definitely a hero. He potentially saved my dad's life. Oh, absolutely. Sear was a hero. I don't know if you'd find a human being that would do what I asked Sear to try and do unarmed. I learned about uh, courage, loyalty, fearlessness. He taught me all those lessons just that night. If that's not heroic, I don't know it. So yeah, he was a hero. Steve Kay will always remember Sear as both a wonderful friend and an incredible partner. Though Sear's life was cut short, his legacy has improved the fate of future generations of service animals. Through the bulletproof vest donated in Sear's honor, other police dogs now benefit from enhanced safety. And the law inspired by Sears' sacrifice provides service animals the protection these dedicated companions deserve. For more information, visit cmt.ca slash pet heroes.